fresh water that comes to the rivers or through rivers to the ocean in the world. But what's really interesting is that in spite of its length and its size, there's no bridge across the Amazon River. You know, one of the smallest rivers that's mentioned many times in the Bible has the biggest bridge. We're going to talk about it in this edition of Revelation Now. Good evening, friends. We'd like to welcome you all once again to Revelation Now, the special Bible prophecy seminar. If you're new to our time together, we've been looking at some very important prophecies found in the Bible. Tonight, we're looking at a very important subject, so we're glad you have tuned in. We'd also like to let those who are watching, if you'd like to get the live Spanish translation of this uh, seminar, you can visit the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook or YouTube channel, or you can go to the Revelation Now Spanish website. We'd also like to remind those who would like to get a translation of this for the deaf. We have between five and 600 people tuning in for each program, and they've been taking advantage of our sign language, so we want to thank those who are helping uh, by doing that. Following the presentation this evening, we will be having your Bible questions. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can type in your Bible question in the uh, little box there with information, the comment section, and we'll try and answer as many of your questions as possible following the program. Now, this is the beginning of a big weekend for us here. Tonight, a very important subject, but tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., that specific time, Saturday morning, we're going to be having a very important presentation. It's entitled Bowing to the Beast. So we're going to be getting into some of those deeper prophecies. So tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Pacific time, and then also tomorrow evening, that's Saturday evening at 7 p.m., is part two of that same subject, dealing with the beast power revelation. It's entitled Mark for Death. So be sure to tune in for all of the programs this weekend. Tell your friends it's not too late to have them join us as well. We'd like to thank those who have sent in comments telling us where you're watching from. We have Emma from Texas. She says, thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to use you to teach us about the book of Revelation. I have learned so much. We have Nancy from Colorado. She says, I'm new to the faith, and I'm very thankful to Pastor Doug for his presentation on cleansing the sanctuary. And then Patrick from the Netherlands says, I've been staying up every night till 4 a.m. to watch your wonderful programs. Thank you for making this possible. And then Isaac from Tanzania says, I love this seminar. I've been watching from the very beginning and sharing with all of my friends. Thanks. So again, we want to thank you for letting us know that you're out there and you're participating and you're sharing with your friends. Tonight's presentation is entitled Born in a River. And we have a lesson that goes along with the presentation. It's got the same name. It's entitled Born in a River. And this is our free gift to all of those who are Watching. If you'd like to receive this, just go to the website, Revelation Now, and you can download the lesson, Born in a River. And again, we want to encourage you to read through the lesson, look up the Bible verses. It'll help clarify the teachings uh, for each of these presentations. Our free gift for tonight is a book entitled, Baptism, Is It Really Necessary? Now, if you'd like to receive a digital copy of this book, all you have to do is text the word baptized to the number 40544 if you're in North America and we'll send you a digital copy of the book. Now if you're outside of North America just go to the revelationnow.com website and you'll be able to download the book Baptism Is It Really Necessary? Well I'd like to invite Pastor Buck, Doug to come forward and uh, we'll prepare for our presentation this evening. Yes. Good evening Pastor Doug. Hi how are you Pastor Good Ross. good good. Very important weekend as you mentioned. We've got something Tonight, yes. tomorrow morning, you're going to be dealing with signs or at least identifying the beast power revelation. That's right. The Antichrist. So, folks, don't want to miss and that. And what the mark is, tell your yeah. friends to tune yeah, absolutely. in. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's start with prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful that we're able to uh, gather together and open up your word and study a very important subject of how we can start fresh in our walk with you. So we ask your blessing upon our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Ross. And again, friends, don't forget that immediately following our presentation, Pastor Ross is going to join me again. We'll do our best to answer questions you may have on any of the things we presented thus far, and especially on tonight's subject. Well, the river, the, the river, the lesson tonight is titled Born in a River, and uh, it is a prophecy subject. But uh, as always, we like to start with a verse from Revelation. 
And this is the last chapter in the Bible. It says in Revelation 22, verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Now, we're going to go back and look at a story in the Bible that talks about a river. You know, probably one of the most famous rivers in the Bible is the Jordan River. You got a lot of miracles that seem to happen with the Jordan River. And I was teasing you a little bit with the opening amazing fact about the Amazon. I think it is fascinating that there is no bridge that spans the Amazon all through its 4,000 mile course. I think some of the tributaries have bri bridges, but not the main Amazon. But one of the smallest rivers in the world and the lowest river in the world is the Jordan River, which is found in the land of Israel. It's an interesting piece of geography because it starts in the mountains of Lebanon way up above um, sea level and it runs down the Jordan Valley, goes into the Sea of Galilee, out of the Sea of Galilee, down into the Dead Sea where it's about 1,300 feet below sea level and one of the hottest places on earth, it is the lowest place on earth. Jordan River supplies the Sea of Galilee full of life and fish, and it also supplies the Dead Sea, nothing alive there. And the difference, of course, is that the Jordan River is going into the Sea of Galilee, and it's also going out the other side. So because it's a channel, it stays alive. It receives and it gives, and that's like our lives. But the Dead Sea only takes, and it just takes and takes. It never gives, and the water evaporates before it can... Uh, flow out and so it's just a sinkhole of salt and nothing is alive in there. But the Jordan River also is a border for the children of Israel. When they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Jordan River when they went into the Promised Land. God miraculously parted it. He made a bridge. And another time, when Elisha the prophet crossed and when Elijah the prophet crossed, the Lord both times miraculously parted the river. And what's really important is that some miracles have taken place in the river that relate to our subject tonight. It is, in a sense, a river of life. So if we go to our story that you find in the second book of Kings, chapter 5, it's a story about uh, an Assyrian general by the name of Naaman. And it introduces the story by telling us that Naaman was a mighty man with his master. He's a rich man. He's a powerful man. He's a courageous man seems to have everything going for him. He's famous, he's wealthy, he's popular, he's got a good reputation. But then it has five words at the end of that verse and it says, but he was a leper. And leprosy in Bible times was called the, the touch of God or the curse of God. And, uh, you know, it is often equated with sin in the Bible because it was contagious. People were separated they could no longer go to the public places of worship because they were considered unclean. They were separated from their, their families, their wives, their children. They often had to live in colonies with other lepers. And then they were slowly dying. So it tells us all these wonderful things about Naaman. And people would say, oh, I want to be Naaman until they read the last verses, last words. But he was a leper. And then it tells us that uh, the story has an interesting turn. Naaman being a wealthy general, he's got many servants. One of the servants in his home is a little girl that had been captured from somewhere in northern Israel and taken away, and she had probably been sold in the marketplace and bought by Naaman's family, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She knew her master had come down with leprosy, and she might have thought, well, good, I hope he rots because they stole me away from my home country. But like Joseph years earlier, she said, you know, if God has me here, I'm going to serve God wherever I'm at. And when she saw her master was sick, she remembered the stories of the prophet in Israel, Elisha, that everybody that came to Elisha for help, they received help. Nobody ever got a no from Elisha. He always helped everybody, and he performed many miracles. And with childlike faith, she told her mistress, and this is 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 3, would God that the prophet Elisha, that he was with the prophet Elisha, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Well, you know, when you're dying, you can get desperate. And pretty soon word reached Naaman that uh, this prophet down in Israel could heal him of his leprosy. Well, they knew about Elisha, that he was a powerful prophet of God. And so Naaman got a letter from his king, and he got some money, and he got a contingent of soldiers, and they took their caravan down to Israel. 
And he goes to the king and he says, uh, I've got this letter. King says, you got a prophet here that will heal me of my leprosy. Well, the king of Israel said, I don't know anything about this. And he became all agitated. And Elisha the prophet said, send him to me. He'll find out there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman, with his entourage, he comes to the humble home of Elisha the prophet. And he expects this prophet is going to be like the magicians up in Syria. He's going to perform some, you know, abracadabra and throw gunpowder in the fire and declare him clean. But he doesn't even come out. Elisha sends his servant out to him. And, and his name was Gehazi, the servant. He comes and he gives him the message, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you. You may have even lost, you know, with leprosy, you can sometimes lose your digits, your nose, your toes. It's awful. It says your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. Well, you heard that. He said, wash? What are you suggesting? Now, what does it mean if someone tells you to wash? How do you dirty? What does it mean if they tell you to wash seven times? You're really dirty. And what does it mean if they tell you to wash seven times in a dirty river? You must be dirtier than the river. So, you know, Naaman gets upset. And he said, are not Aben and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I go home and wash in them and be clean? And he rode away in a rage. But, you know, on his way home, he had to drive by the Jordan River. And he kept staring at it. The servant said, wash seven times, you'll be clean. Naaman's servants rode up close to him. You know, he's, <laughs> he had a pandemic back then. They had to keep their distance. But it says they drew near and they said, Master, if the prophet had told you to go climb a mountain, you know, or fight some battle, you would have done it. He said, he's telling you to wash and be clean. You're right here. Why don't you do it? And so finally he stopped his horse and he humbled himself. He got off his horse. He peeled off his armor and he looked at the brownish water of the Jordan. You can, friends, when I read the Bible, I read all about the Jordan. I thought it was like the Mississippi or something. Then you go to Israel, you realize you can throw a rock across the Jordan. It's not a big river. And uh, in the summer, it's a series of stagnating pools. And so he's thinking, I'm supposed to wash in that and be clean? But you see, Naaman thought his problem was leprosy. His problem was pride. So he got his armor off and he took off his clothes. And, you know, <laughs> we sort of come to the Lord just as I am. <laughs> no medals, no stripes. And he got in the water and he dipped himself down and he could feel the water sting in his sores and he came back up. He still had his leprosy and he was going to march out. His servant said, the message was wash seven times. The miracle doesn't happen until the seventh time. So he dunked himself again. Nothing. Dunked himself again. And every time he's dunking himself, he's becoming a little more humble. And... Uh, after five times, he comes up and he thinks, oh, this is ridiculous. How embarrassing. I'm going to quit. And his servant said, no, no, two more, seven times. Now, here's a question for you. Does God mean what he says in the Bible when he gives a number? When God said to Joshua, march around Jericho seven times and a miracle will happen. The blessing didn't come until the seventh time. When God says, I've blessed the seventh day, do we pick our own number or do we pick the day that God picks? Does God mean what he says? Six times, still a leper. But when he went down the seventh time, I know he had to feel something. Because if you're missing some of your skin or flesh or fingers, and, and he came up, he probably felt and things just popping back into place. And he came out of the water, and the scars and the sores are gone, and he realizes he's clean. The Bible says his flesh was restored to him. And not only was his flesh restored, it goes on, it says his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And I can just picture that. This is really the story of a Christian. Because a Christian is like a soldier, like Naaman, but we're also called babies. We're, in, we're newborn. And here, this story of Naaman being washed in the Jordan and a miracle of the leprosy being washed away you know, one of the first miracles Jesus performed was a leper came to him full of leprosy. He said, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Everyone's running away from Jesus because this man is contagious. <laughs> we can kind of relate today, huh? And uh, Jesus did not run. He said, I am willing. He touched him and he became clean. Leprosy is a type of sin in the Bible. 
Washing in the Jordan is a symbol of new birth and being washed away from your sins. It's really the story of baptism. Now, we're going to talk about the subject of baptism today, and I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor Doug, you advertise Revelation now, and here you are, you, you're throwing us a curve, you're talking to us about baptism. That's kind of a churchy subject. I just want to know about prophecy. Well, friends, the Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus begins with a baptism. He begins his ministry at baptism. The Bible, New Testament, ends by telling people to go and to baptize. This is a priority to Jesus. Knowing about the beasts and Armageddon and the rapture and all these things, it's not going to save you if you've not committed your life to the Lord. So I always insert this very important subject for one reason, because some people have never made a decision to commit their life to Christ. You cannot understand the things we're going to study unless you have done that. That's why we talk about it. Jesus said spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You cannot understand the spiritual things we're going to discuss about last day events unless you commit your life to the Lord. Then it'll become clear. The Bible says otherwise your ears will be stopped, your eyes will be closed, and it's not going to make sense to you. The other reason, there's some of you who've drifted from the Lord. You maybe need to recommit your lives to the Lord and make a, get a new beginning. So we talk about this important subject of baptism. But before we get into our questions, as always, we like to go out, find out what people on the street have to say about our topic for tonight. Baptism to me is a way that you go to your church where you worship the Lord at, and you are cleansed of your sins. Baptism is when you put the old man to death and bring out the new man in Christ. Baptism is to be clean, clean and pure of, of the evil, I guess. Baptism is when someone decides to renew themselves in the name of the Lord. If you give your life to Christ and you kind of kill that old you and come back as your new you, Baptism represents the cleansing of the soul and of the, the vessel that you're in. Um, so when you're dipped into the water, you come back out clean and pure, and then you're supposed to live your life as so. Well, that's a lot of different baptism. The baptism really came from the ancient Egyptians. I would imagine there's uh, multiple types of baptisms. I would say more than 20 plus. No, I don't believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, I believe. Um, an open and uh, repentive uh, position is appropriate and all that's necessary. I was, you know, baptized and confirmed, but, you know, you can still believe in Jesus Christ. You can still believe that he's our Lord and Savior, even if, even if not. In my opinion, no, but that's just my opinion. All right. Well, we had a number of opinions there. Some people are pretty close to the biblical truth on this subject, but we're gonna find out from the word of God, what does it say about this subject of this covenant called baptism, where a person actually makes the decision to transition from death to life to cross the Jordan River, so to speak. And we're gonna go to the first question for tonight, and I think we're gonna learn a lot along the way. It tells us, well, let's read the question. What New Testament prophet washed people in the Jordan River? And I think most people know this, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, 5, and 6 says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and then went out all of Jerusalem and Judea and the region round about Jordan, and they were baptized of him in the Jordan. So when John began baptizing, evidently the people knew something about this, and it represented a cleansing, a spiritual rebirth. He was inviting people to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they wanted their sins washed away. They were looking for the mercy of God and wanted to get a new beginning. So John was there preaching with power and he was also telling people, the Messiah is soon to make his appearance. You need to prepare yourself for his first coming. Well, friends, you know, Jesus is about to come again and we need to be prepared for his second coming. So this is a, a very relevant subject for people in the world to study today. Second question, what glorious Bible ceremony symbolizes the washing away of the leprosy of sin. And we're using that metaphor from the story of Naaman. You can read here in Acts 22, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he says, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You know, it must have been a priority 
because Jesus told the disciples where you go preach, teach, and once people embrace the truth, help them to make a covenant to accept it by going through this, this ceremony of baptism. And I hope somebody, if I don't cover it, I hope someone asks me the question, is it possible to go to heaven if you're not baptized or even if you're not baptized correctly? And maybe I'll get to that a little later, but if not, I hope someone writes that down. Third question. According to the Bible, how many different kinds or methods of baptism are acceptable? Well, you know, it tells us in the Bible there, in uh, Ephesians 4, verse 5, there is one Lord, one faith, and how many? One. one baptism. There's only one Bible, one Holy Spirit, one God, one truth, and yet there are so many different things that are called baptism in the Bible. Um, some churches baptize by sprinkling water. Others do what you call immerse, where a person is dunked. Some immerse a person three times, once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Spirit. Some people sprinkle salt. Some churches sprinkle salt on a person. They call it baptism. Uh, some churches have a method where they just speak words to a person. It's called the dry cleaning method, I suppose. And <laughs> That way, you know, you can call a pastor and he can baptize you over the phone. So there's all these different methods that people call baptism, but does it make a difference? And is there, is there a truth on this subject? Now, I'll tell you why I think this is important to understand. There are only a couple of rituals that Jesus gave the Christian church. The Lord's Supper, two sacraments, you might say, two ceremonies. The Lord's Supper and baptism. In the Lord's Supper, you've got the, the grape juice and the unleavened bread. It's supposed to be unfermented wine and unleavened bread, type of the pure blood and the pure body of Jesus. And uh, those symbols, when they're properly taught from the Bible, they're, they're great with meaning. It means when you partake of that, that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from sin and that his life comes into you and it's the bread of life, the word of God, and there's a lot of beautiful symbols. So what do you think when a youth pastor tells his uh, youth group, he said, we're going to go to McDonald's for communion and it's just a symbol, so we're going to use hamburgers and Coca-Cola and call it communion. Well, I... I know that's an extreme, but you can see how little by little, when people get away from the exact method that God gives us, you can start losing the symbolism, and eventually it gets to where it's just plain old sacrilegious and, and uh, blasphemous. And it's the same thing with baptism. When God says something, these are the words of God. He means what he says. We drift away from the original way, and we can start losing the symbolism and the meaning. So these things are important. So what does baptism mean? Well, there's a, it's rich with meaning. It means several things. I'll tell you quickly, and then I'm going to repeat myself. They say the key to a good sermon is tell people what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. So I, I may repeat myself, and that way I want everyone to catch this, because this is in reality, if you get the subject tonight, and you don't understand everything about the rapture, and you don't understand everything about the millennium, uh, this is really important, because we're talking about committing your life to Christ. It's that river of life where you're born in the river, so to speak. And that's what baptism symbolizes. You must be born again, Jesus said. So baptism represents a new birth. Baptism represents a marriage. It represents a death to the old person. You know, when a person goes under the water and they come back up again, it symbolizes the, a burial of the old person, a birth of the new person. Like when a baby's born, it takes its first breath. And all of these things are wrapped up in, in that the symbol, that ceremony of baptism. So the Greek word, if we want to know something about the method of baptism, it's very easy to determine. It's right there in the word itself. The Greek word that you find in the Bible for baptism is baptizo. And baptizo itself means to dip, to immerse, to plunge underwater. Uh, you cannot sprinkle a little water in a person and say they've been baptized. Uh, if you tell your kids, you're out at the ranch, and you give them the bag of garbage. You say, go out to the, the dump out back, dig a hole, and bury the garbage. And they come back, and the next morning you see garbage scattered all over the yard. Raccoons got into it. And he said, what happened? Did you bury it? They said, no, I went out and sprinkled some dirt on it. Does it make a difference? <laughs> Do you want your sins sprinkled with dirt or buried? And that's why these things are, the symbols actually are relevant. It does matter. You can read in Colossians 2.12. We are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God 
who's raised him from the dead. And also, uh, well, let's read question number four. So how was Jesus, who's our example in all things, how was he baptized? If you want to know what a Christian is, he's a follower of Christ. Well, the Bible tells us Jesus came and he was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. So when John the Baptist started baptizing, if the method of baptism was sprinkling, then um, he didn't need a river. You could sprinkle with the spring water up in Jerusalem. You could sprinkle anywhere. Um, it wasn't just pouring. They needed a place where people could walk on in. They were laid down. They were brought up again. And it symbolized that new birth, a complete thorough washing from sin. And um, I think it really does matter. Now, I want to make something very clear, just so people don't get the wrong idea. I believe there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that were not baptized biblically. There'll be some people in heaven that were not baptized because they did not know. God is merciful. You can read in the book of Acts chapter 17. At the times of this ignorance, God winks at. But now commands everyone everywhere to repent. When we know the truth, we should walk in the truth is what it tells us. And you're going to find during the seminar, God is trying to restore truth to his people before Jesus returns. So Jesus is our example. He went down to the river. And was Jesus baptized to wash away his sin? Did Jesus sin? The Bible said, who did no sin. He died for our sins. So why was he baptized? A couple things. Jesus was baptized for one thing as an example. The Bible tells us he's given us an example that we should walk even as he walked. The second thing is, in the same way that Jesus died on the cross, not for his sins, but for our sins, he was baptized in behalf of those who maybe could not be. You remember when Christ was on the cross dying, there was a thief. I suspect he was the thief on the right. The Bible says the goats are on the left, the sheep are on the right. And that thief turned and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, if you can go get baptized, I'll save you. Is that what he said? No, he said, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. He promised him everlasting life, but he, he wasn't baptized. I think Jesus gives people like that credit for his baptism. I've been in the hospital with people who are dying, my own brother, and uh, never baptized. And uh, I asked there at the end when he was in the hospital if I could pray with him, and he asked me to pray with him. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing him in the kingdom, but he couldn't be baptized. So as you're listening to this, some of you are saying, well, Pastor Doug, but uh, maybe I wasn't baptized correctly. Well, it's not too late. You can do it the right way, but let's find out what the Bible teaches. Jesus went down into the river. He came up out of the river, We'll look at a couple of other examples. It tells us that now John, chapter 3, verse 23, John the Baptist was baptizing in Anon, near Salim, because there was much water there. And it says they came and they were baptized. Why did John baptize there? Deep water, which is sometimes hard to find in a desert, because they were immersing people, so they could get the experience of the full cleansing, holding their breath, taking that new breath like a baby being born again. And uh, they come out of the water and through faith, H2O doesn't wash away our sin. It's the blood of Jesus. But it's through faith we're forgiven. But ceremonies matter. So if you're going to get married, how important is a wedding? Most women will agree it's important. They kind of look forward to it. Well, let's face it, it's a ceremony. And, you know, even as a pastor, I often have people, young couples, they start shacking up together and they say, well, pastor, we're married in God's eyes. I can't tell you how many people told me, we're married in God's eyes. And then they had a tiff and they break up and they go, move in with someone else. And then they move in with someone else. And, and uh, now marriage is a covenant. It's a serious decision. It's a promise. It's a public uh, decision. And there are certain rights and privileges and laws connected with it after you go through that covenant and that public ceremony. Baptism is the ceremony ordained by Jesus himself where he said, I want you to publicly declare that you are accepting me, that you want that cleansing from sin, and by my grace, you're going to follow me. You're going to live in a newness of life. So it did matter. The method also matters. How did Philip, now we're going to the book of Acts chapter 8, how did Philip the evangelist baptize the treasurer of Ethiopia? Now, it's a great story. God just speaks to Philip and he says, go down to the desert by Gaza 
So he obeys and he goes down to this place. And while he's there, all of a sudden he runs into this um, very important man. He's the treasurer for the Queen Candace of, Phil of Ethiopia. And he's, in, he's a, a believer in Jehovah. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah. Must have money because not everybody had their own private scrolls back then. And he's reading the prophecy in Isaiah that talks about Jesus dying for our sins. And he's reading out loud. And Philip hears him. He says, do you understand what you're reading? He said, well, how can I unless someone helps me? He said, you know, can I help you? He said, well, come on up in the chariot. So he hopped up in his chariot, first hitchhiker in the Bible. And as they're riding along, he shows him from the scriptures that Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And he's so excited that as they're riding by, he either rode by an oasis or they, maybe he's going down by Gaza. You could actually see the Mediterranean. He said, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip took him and he baptized. He said, he said, can I get baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart. Now, so that's one of the criteria for baptism. You need to believe. So they both went down into the water, both of them. Not one person sprinkling another. Both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And the Bible tells us that when they were come up out of the water, so they go down in, they come up out, it says the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And Philip suddenly found himself God said, look, you walked all, all the way to the desert to do my will down there. I'm going to give you a quick trip back up to uh, Caesarea. <laughs> it's like first example of someone being beamed in the Bible. It just took him and transported him. But uh, it was so important that that man go through the ceremony that he had Philip go all the way down to baptize that one man. So does it matter to God? I think it must. What other truths are symbolized by baptism? Well, you can read in Romans 6, verse 4 and 5. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in a newness of life. So baptism is telling us that we should be willing to repent of our sins and turn away. Now, does that mean you need to be perfect before you're baptized? You know, nobody would ever be ready. But it does mean you need to forsake any known or habitual sins and be willing to repent of those things and walk in a newness of life. Um, if I had to wait until I knew everything about Karen before I got baptized, you'd never get baptized. Or married. Or married. That's what I was trying to say. That's right. <laughs> so, but you want to know the main things. I think everybody, if I were to ask you, did you learn a lot of things afterward? I said, yep. Uh, some good, maybe not all. <laughs> But, uh, so if you say, I'm going to wait until I know everything about the Bible, well, you'll never be ready. Or I'm going to wait until I'm perfect. You'll probably never feel perfect. But if I'd come to Karen and said, Karen, I love you and I want to marry you, but uh, you don't mind if I keep uh, dating Betty and Jane. She'd say, what? Get out of here. She said, I, I want exclusive commitment here. And so if we go to Jesus and say, Lord, you know, I, I love you. I want to follow you. I want to be a Christian, but I, I'm still dating the devil. Is that okay? He said, no. Now, it doesn't mean you're never going to make a mistake in sin, but if you're involved in some kind of habitual sin, you want to confess and repent of that before baptism. Some people think, if I can just get baptized, suddenly I'll have the power to turn away from my sins. Now, that has probably happened on occasion, but that's not the way to do it. That would be like me going to Karen and say, Karen, if you just marry me, I think I could stop dating these other girls and I'll love you. No, you want to have the love and the commitment before the ceremony. Is that clear? Yes. So you make sure you love the person and you've got the commitment. Two dangers with baptism. Some people wait too long. Some people go too fast. And that happens with marriage too. And so you want to make sure you've got your timing right. But uh, we'll go through what the criteria are. Furthermore, Romans 6, 4, and 5, if we then have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So baptism is a symbol of a death and a burial and a resurrection. And some people wonder, um, isn't Sunday what God gave us to celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of Christ? Uh, no, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. He did give us baptism to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so that's why we participate in it. And then the other thing that's beautiful, Jesus said we need to be born again. Baptism, you know, when a baby is in that envelope of water, 
and it emerges and takes its first breath, you've got new life, and there's innocence there. And so uh, God looks upon us as though we're perfectly innocent after we've been baptized and we commit ourselves to the Lord. And if you ever sin, as you will, along the way, he's designed, then we have a communion service so you can have a mini baptism in the process. How important is baptism? Why are we talking about this in a revelation program? Again, one reason is because spiritual things are not going to be spiritually recognized and understood unless we make a spiritual commitment. When we surrender our hearts to the Lord, then he opens our understanding. The promise is if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Baptism is a decision where you say, Lord, I want to commit my life to you. Help me understand the truth. And these other mysteries of prophecy will begin to unfold and the importance of them will, will become really clear when we make that commitment. So what does Jesus say? Math, Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. Well, that sounds pretty serious. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? John 3, verse 5. Except a man be born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, I know some people read this verse and they say, except a man be born of water. And they say, well, that means, you know, born of your mother, you're in the embryonic sack of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus say, unless you're born of a woman and the spirit? Anyone here not born of a woman? I mean, that's kind of, he's not talking about these. Unless you're born of your choice to be baptized and God's choice to baptize you with the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. See, the Bible always talks about born of the water, born of the spirit. Children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that's baptism. And he, they were baptized in a pillar of fire. They were born of the water, born of the fire. Planet Earth, back in the days of Noah, everything was wiped out by water. 2 Peter chapter 3 said, when Jesus comes, it's going to be now baptized in fire. Then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. So our world is going to get a new birth after it's born of the water and the fire. You, got, you need kind of both baptisms. So one is your choice for the baptism, and then God gives you the spirit baptism as well. What blessed ceremony can be compared to baptism? Well, I've already kind of told you this little secret. Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's compared to like a beautiful wedding. It's a new beginning. It's a covenant. It's that commitment to Jesus. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You know, the Bible calls the uh, New Jerusalem the bride of Christ. And even in some of the last verses of Revelation, it says the spirit and the bride says come. He's inviting us to come to him. And so baptism is this beautiful ceremony that represents the commitment, the covenant, the new, new birth, the washing away of the old sin, the death of the old person. I couldn't stand here and talk to you folks about this subject if it wasn't for the promise that through baptism God has taken my sins and cast them into the depths of the sea. But I really believe that I'm not the same person. The Bible says old things are passed away, all things are become new. Baptism is sort of that transition point. Jesus began his ministry at his baptism. And it's a very important turning point for a believer as well. Number nine, what command did Jesus give to his people just before he ascended to heaven? Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so um, people need to be taught when they're baptized. And we're doing the gospel teaching here. We've had presentations on what is the gospel. But um, there's some teaching that also comes afterwards. So again, you don't have to wait until you know everything, but you need to know what the basics are. And before a person's baptized, they ought to say, yes, I believe the Bible is the word of God. Yes, I believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior and believe through faith that he's washed away my sins. And there's some basic vows. When I marry people, I go through the wedding vows. And uh, those vows are very important. It's a covenant, a promises. The, the promises are made because of love. And when we're baptized, we're making promises 
uh, because of love for the Lord. So by the way, those are the last words of Jesus. Go ye therefore teach and baptize. Also you find that in the Gospel of Mark. So I would think the last words of Christ ought to be a first priority for Christians. Number 10. So obviously there's a lot of dear people, Christians from other faiths that maybe don't understand biblical baptism. Where did all these counterfeit forms of baptism come from? Mark 7 verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. They've been, gradually it began to change. Now let me give you a little history real quick. Um, baptism, for hundreds of years after Christ, all Christians were baptized by immersion. They followed the biblical method. It was so clear in the Bible, it was hard to misunderstand. And just uh, an example here, for instance, is a first century baptistry in Philippi. The church is built around a baptistry. You can see it right there. They would go down in this pool, they'd get baptized. Even the Jewish Essenes down by the Dead Sea, they had baptistries. And John the Baptist didn't baptize very far from them. They, they all knew it represented a spiritual cleansing. You can go to a 5th century baptistry in, in Emmaus. Again, they went down in the water. They were immersed. They had room there for the pastor and the candidate to be immersed. And uh, they were symbolically washed from their sins. Now, I've been here to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and many people know about that building. Not as many know about the building that is adjoining or just next door to it. Almost looks like the tower is going to fall on it. That church is built around a baptistry, a big one people get into. They were still practicing that kind of baptism over a thousand years after Christ. They were baptizing biblically by immersion. And even in Rome, they've got this edifice here, and it is a church built around, there it is inside, a baptistry. And so, what happened? Well, as with all compromise of truth, it happens little by little. You know, the devil's got a counterfeit for every truth of God. He's got a counterfeit for the Holy Spirit. He's got a counterfeit for uh, love. He's got a counterfeit for speaking in tongues. There's the true and there's, there's the false. You just find any Bible doctrine, the devil will almost always have some counterfeit for it out there. There are also counterfeit baptisms. Um, gradually, over time, uh, people felt it was inconvenient. It wasn't until, you can read here, the Council of Ravenna in AD 1311 that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid. They were still immersing. But they said, we're also, since it's a symbol, if someone wants to just get sprinkled or if they want to be, have it poured on them, that will be equally as valid as immersion as the rite of baptism. So here it is, like 1,300 years after Christ, and they were doing it biblically, and they gradually began to compromise. What happened is, for example, somebody was sick, and the priests were teaching, you had to be baptized or you couldn't be saved. They said, well, they're too sick to baptize, so what should we do? Let's bless the water. We'll call it holy water. We'll wrap up a sheet. We'll wrap them up in a wet sheet. We'll call that baptism. Uh, or they said, you know, um, we got royalty who wants to get baptized. They don't really want... To, it's not very dignified, you know, to get down in the water and let's just sprinkle a little water on them. Well, started, they started pouring a little bit. Since it's just a symbol, we don't need it all done. Started just uh, pouring it and then sprinkling it, and uh, from there, everything began to change. God wants us to get back to the Bible, I believe. So with this background, what about child baptisms? Does the Bible teach it's okay to baptize babies? What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible tells us you need to repent. You need to confess your sins. You need to be taught. You need to believe with all your heart. Can a baby do those things? Has a baby sinned? What, what sins are they repenting of? Now, many who are watching right now, you're saying, Pastor Doug, I was baptized as a baby. You're telling me that I'm not qualified. No, I'm telling you, your parents dedicated you. When Jesus was a baby... He was brought by his parents to the temple and they dedicated him to God and that's when he was named. Some people call it a christening, like when you name a ship and you crack the bottle over there. Uh, you maybe have, were dedicated by your parents, but baptism is something you must decide. It's your decision. Every individual makes their own decision. Nobody makes it for you. And so um, children can't repent. They can't believe. They can't be taught. They have no sins to repent of. Baptism should happen as a person gets older so they can comprehend these spiritual truths. Question 11. What does the Bible say about those who put the teachings of men before the truth of God? 
When Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 9, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There's a lot of man-made doctrines out there that just are not in the Bible. Uh, places where the church has drifted far away from the teaching of God's word. And whenever that happens, we miss a blessing. We miss the power of God's spirit. We miss the real meaning. And so we've got to pray that God helps us to stick with the word. Galatians 1 verse 8, Paul says, Though we, or even an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then would we, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So Jesus said they are the doctrines of man, and if anyone diverges from the Bible teaching, let them be accursed. Paul warned the early church. He said, after my departure, grievous wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves, people will arise teaching perverse things. And Paul talks about doctrines of devils. All kinds of false teachings have come in that just are not based on the Bible. So that modern Christianity barely resembles the real thing. Before Jesus comes back, he is calling people to return to the truth of his word. That's why we do programs like this. Question number 12. But doesn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit replace baptism by immersion? What does the Bible say? The Bible says you need both. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. I think we touched on this verse. Peter, when preaching there at Pentecost, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You notice that? That's a wonderful promise. He didn't say you might. He said you shall. Now, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to make our choice to be baptized, and then we pray for God to baptize us. Remember, um, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but the one who's coming after me, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we need that Holy Spirit fire baptism. Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Some churches put a big emphasis on water baptism, they don't talk about the importance of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, of course, the Holy Spirit came down in mighty power. They were filled. The gospel went flying like fire. And I think that's going to happen again before Jesus comes back. We, once again, need a Pentecostal baptism. A lot of churches say, oh, we've got it. I don't think we've seen what they saw back in those days. I believe you're going to see signs and wonders and miracles uh, that <laughs> not only are equal what happened at Pentecost, I think it'll be even greater in scope because the work is even greater in scope right now. Now, when do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, sometimes in the Bible, people got the Holy Spirit after baptism. As with the disciples at Pentecost, they had been baptized by John the Baptist, but then later they got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Cornelius and his family, they got baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then Peter said, oh, wait, you got to get baptized in water also. And uh, with Jesus, he got baptized with the Holy Spirit and water at the same time. Sometimes it happens that way. So God can do it any way he wants. According to the Bible, what must a person do before he's baptized? Now, I'm going to go through these quickly because I think I've touched on them. But just so we're being very clear, because I think some of you listening right now are thinking, you know, I either have never been baptized biblically, or maybe you were baptized and you've kind of drifted and you're wondering, Maybe I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. First of all, understand the main teachings of Jesus, what it means to be saved, to repent of your sins, to follow him, to be part of a, a Christian body. B, believe the teachings of Jesus. We, it's one thing to say, oh, I understand them, but do you believe them? Believe them means willing to follow them. It means belive them. And so if you say, yes, I believe these things are true, I want to order my life in harmony with these beliefs. That's what it means. And you remember when uh, Philip spoke to the Ethiopian, he said, if you believe with all your heart that Jesus died for your sins, you may be baptized. Repent of your past sins and ask God to give you his power of his spirit to live a new life, and he will. But tell the Lord you're sorry. Now, part of repentance is a verbal aspect to that. Repentance means being sorry for your past sins. I think most people are. But then it means confessing them to God. And you might be thinking, why? Doesn't God know everything? Yes, but something happens in your heart. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
How much unrighteousness? Hell cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So repent of your sins. Confess your sins to God. This is what happened when uh, the Philippian jailer came to Paul and Silas. He said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your household. And then they taught him. Later that night, they baptized him. He did believe. He repented of his sins. Matter of fact, he nearly killed himself that night. He was so tired of his life of sin. Agree to turn from a life of sin. You remember that woman, many believe was Mary Magdalene, caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you. Go, you're free. And sin no more. Turn from that life that you've been living. And uh, I'm putting the verses on the screen. And they're also in your support material. I hope you request those. They're free. Answer F, accept Jesus as your personal Savior and experience that new birth. And say, you know, I've made, I know Jesus is in my heart. I've asked him in. I, I sense there's this change. Just like before marriage, you want to know there's love there. Question 14. Is rebaptism ever proper or appropriate? Yes. Uh, there's three examples where you might get rebaptized. One is if you are not baptized biblically. If you were baptized by, you know, sprinkling or pouring or salt or words or one of these other methods, you want to follow Jesus' example and do it by immersion. And do it with a Bible-believing church. Just, you know, I know people, I hear this sermon, they run out and grab their friend and said, well, you dunk me in the swimming pool. There's more to it than that. Uh, the other reason to be rebaptized is if you were baptized, you were a Bible Christian, but you drifted from the Lord, that doesn't mean you missed church one week, but it means you really turn away from God. You sort of divorce yourself from the church and the Lord. You may need to be rebaptized, kind of remarried. Third reason, you have an example here in Acts 19. Paul is preaching up in Asia. He encounters 12 Ephesian believers. They've heard about John the Baptist. They were baptized by immersion, but they left before Jesus began his ministry. And Paul said, were you baptized? And they said, yes, we were. We were baptized by John. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we've not even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said, unto what then were you baptized? They said, John's baptism, John the Baptist. Paul said, verily, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that should believe on him which should, should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, so... They were rebaptized because they came into a whole new understanding of the truth. And, you know, I might mention that uh, I've been baptized twice. First time I was baptized, I read the Bible. I was up in the cave, accepted Jesus, just was a baby Christian. And some Christians, two Christian gentlemen, came hiking by my cave. They were part of the Jesus movement. They were from, I think, Calvary Baptist Church. And... They said, uh, they wanted to witness to me. They said, you know the Lord? As a matter of fact, I just accepted the Lord a few days ago. I read my Bible up here and I finally gave my heart to the Lord and first chance I really had to tell someone that. They said, oh, were you baptized? I said, no. I know I read about it. I hadn't even thought about it, even though I read it. And they said, they gave me a quick machine gun Bible study on baptism. They took me to the creek right outside of my cave, and which, by the way, came from melted snow and it was winter. And they baptized me. And I can tell you, I did feel born again for a little while because it, it felt really good to get out of that water. But they hadn't taught me. And after they, they kept hiking, they said, oh, congratulations, you're a Christian, you're baptized, you're saved. It's wonderful. They left. I thought, wow, I'm so excited. I'm going to go to town and celebrate with my friends. Went to town, got some beer, and said, hey, guys, I got baptized today. <laughs> I was in jail before the sun went down that day. <laughs> True story. So I had not been properly taught. Uh, several years later, I met a godly minister who did teach me, and I was baptized. And I have not had any more beer, and the only time I'm in jail now is to visit people. So I understood what the commitment meant after that. Question 15. Is baptism connected with joining a church? Yes. Acts 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. It says they were baptized and added to the church. Acts 2.47 Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice the connection. Baptized and added to the church. 
Babies should be part of a family. A little lamb that is not part of a fold is going to get taken by the wolves. And you might be thinking, oh, Pastor Doug, I, I'm spiritual, but I don't, I'm not religious. And so <laughs> being part of a religion is a bad thing. You know, friends, if you're not part of an organized religion, you're probably part of a disorganized one. A Jesus church is organized. Oh, but there's hypocrites in the church. And as a pastor once said, there's always room for one more. So, yeah, there are people that do things wrong in church. And you know one reason you need to be part of a church? God needs to save us. You cannot be saved if you don't learn to love God and love your neighbor. And that means sometimes you need to be around some people that will challenge your love. And that can even happen in a church. So we need to be part of a church family. Jesus said, I've called you into one body. Colossians 1.18. He is the head of the body, the church. We are baptized into the body of Christ. We become different members and parts of one body. Some of the ears, some of the eyes, some of the nose, some of the toes. We're all different parts of the body, but we need to be connected. If a toe is off on the floor by itself, it doesn't last very long. Or a nose. It needs to be part of the body or we don't survive. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Now, if I refuse baptism, whose counsel am I refusing? This is what the Bible says. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God. Of who? The counsel of the pastor, the counsel of the apostles. Now, they were rejecting the counsel, the teaching of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So it's a serious matter with God when he commands us, go, therefore, teach, baptize. And Jesus, by his own example, baptize. He begins a life of ministry. And he says, I want you to make a commitment to you if you believe in me. If you're not with me, then you shouldn't make that commitment. But if you want to be in heaven, you need to be born of the water and born of the spirit. And we need both baptisms. When Jesus was baptized, what did his father say? Now you'll find this both in the gospel of Mark and in Matthew. I'm going to read it to you from Matthew here. It tells us in Matthew chapter 3, that uh, verse 16 and 17, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And when he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, you know, friends, I'm going to back up and I want to show you these words again more carefully. What happened to Jesus at his baptism is what the Lord wants to happen to each one of us. You see, Jesus was not baptized for himself. He was baptized as our example and he wants us to share in that experience. He came up out of the water. First of all, he came, he humbled himself, he was baptized. And... Uh, when he came out of the water, the heavens were open. Before we're baptized, in one sense, the heavens are closed. Jesus said, when you pray, you pray in my name. That's assuming you've made a commitment to Christ. You have no right to expect God to answer your prayers if you haven't committed your life to him. Now, God is good, and he answers the prayers of a lot of people, but the Lord tells us when we pray in his name, that means we've committed our lives to him. The heavens are open in a new way. And it says that... Uh, he saw, we will now see in a new way. Our eyes are open. That's why we study baptism before we get into these heavy prophetic subjects. It also says the Spirit of God. He sees the Spirit. Spirit came into his life. What does the Spirit bring? Comes like a dove. What's a dove symbolize? Peace comes into our hearts at baptism. A lighting upon him and suddenly a voice. He's not only seeing, now he's hearing. Our ears will be opened. Our eyes are open. We're now hearing Whose voice? God's voice speaking to us in a new way. And what is that voice saying? This is my beloved. We're not just the children out there. We are beloved. And he says son or daughter, meaning he's adopted us into his family. In whom I am what? Well pleased. Jesus comes out of the water, says this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What happened to Christ is what happens to every true believer when they're baptized. You come out of the water, now for you, you're married to Christ, the heavens are open to you. Jesus said, ask in my name. You've asked nothing. Ask now that your joy might be full. He says, I will now give you new hearing. I'll give you new seeing, new vision. I'll declare that you are adopted. You are my son. You're my daughter. And I'm well pleased with you. All your sins are washed away. 
Have you gone through your life thinking God is always angry at you? I remember preaching this story once in a, a town here in Northern California and a, a lady came up to me and she was crying. She said, I've been in the church all my life and it never occurred to me that God could be pleased with me. And uh, that baptism represented that new birth and she just had such a joy. She, she actually got rebaptized, and I still remember the smile on her face to this day. And Christ is asking us to experience that. He wants us to have that new beginning, that new birth, like a little baby. What did uh, the Lord tell the Apostle Paul through Ananias? In Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, when Paul recognized that Jesus was the Christ, he said, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Pray to God, be baptized. He will wash away your sins. And Paul was filled with the power of the Spirit and became one of the greatest uh, teachers in the New Testament. Now, this is one of those nights. There's a few nights during our seminar. We ask you to respond. We don't do these seminars just to be interesting. We do it because we want people to be ready for Jesus coming. I hope that's not a secret. We're going to ask some of your meeting in groups where your group leader is going to hand out a card like this. Here, we'll put it on the screen. If you're watching, we're going to ask you during our break, before Bible, Bible questions, if you want to make a decision to get baptized, I want to pray for you. I'd like to know about that decision. You can let us know online. But here are the questions I'm going to ask you. When you go to your card, or you can make that decision now and mark it later and send it to us. Realizing that I'm a sinner... I want to repent of my sins and accept Jesus as my personal Savior. You might be thinking, well, that's a good idea. One of these days, Pastor Doug, I'd like to do that. There's no time like now. The best time to listen to God's voice is when you're hearing it. Jesus said, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. So he's speaking to you now. Make the decision now. If you want to be a Christian and you want to follow Jesus and accept his salvation, say yes there. Secondly, if you say, I love Jesus and I desire to follow his example of baptism by immersion, I'd like to know that. We want to pray for you. Mark that. You can make your decision right now. It doesn't mean no one's going to knock on your door and <laughs> force you into a baptism. It means you've made your decision. It's like setting a date for a wedding. And then you prepare for that. We hope that you'll talk to a pastor and we'll be able to help answer your questions. Third question. Some of you out there, this is important. I've wandered away from Jesus and I'd like to rededicate my life to him and be rebaptized. You maybe know you need a new beginning and you want that uh, fresh experience. Write that down. We'll pray for you and you can get some counsel on how to proceed. And then that fourth question. I'm considering baptism and I'd like to have somebody visit me. Friends, we've just been teaching the word of God. I'm, I'm not really a preacher as much as a teacher. But I know I've told you the truth. And Jesus is clear. He wants you to be part of his bride, his church. He loves you. He wants you to hear his voice say, you are now his beloved daughter, his son, in whom he is well pleased and have all of your sins washed away. He'll look upon you as a newborn baby. And he wants to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I should warn you in all fairness, Jesus, when he was baptized, God filled him with the Spirit. He began a life of ministry. The devil also came to try to discourage him from his ministry. But Christ overcame every temptation. He said, it is written. When you're baptized, there may be trials afterward. But you're beginning a journey to the promised land, and there's a joy that is worth much more than any of the trouble, friends. You'll never be sorry. I've never met anybody that was sorry. They decided to accept the one that died for their sins, that loves them that much. So I'd like to pray with you. And... Uh, uh, encourage you fill out this uh, card please let us know you can go to the revelation.com website revelationnow.com website let us know you can fill out your card online what your decision is so we can pray for you as well Father in heaven I just pray that your spirit will be with those who are grappling with this eternal decision uh, some have uh, wandered Lord and you're calling them to return and get that new beginning others have been longing for an opportunity to start their lives over, a life with you, a life of new hope and joy and, and eternal life as, your, as their goal. Bless them with that experience now. I pray your spirit will be in each one's heart. Encourage and move them to follow you and to trust you. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, don't go anywhere, friends. We're going to be back with Bible questions. And uh, also, I want you to remember, uh, we have the lesson tomorrow morning. It's 11 o'clock, talking about bowing to the beast. You don't want to miss that. Be back in just a moment. of prisoners still haven't experienced the transforming power of God. Please consider unlocking captive hearts with a life-changing gift. Thank you. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Revelation Now. And uh, we're going to be taking some of your Bible questions. So we want to thank those who have sent in your Bible questions already. And if you haven't yet... If you're watching this on Facebook, you can just type your question in the comments section and uh, we'll send that through and we'll get it live. So we haven't seen all these questions, Pastor Doug, so it's always fun to see uh, the different questions, where they're coming from. Um, we have some questions that have already been sent in and we're going to put that up on the screen and we'll start with those. So the first one is, um, what name should we be baptized in? Yeah, that's a good question and I didn't really get to it in the lesson. Uh, the actual word spoken by the, the minister that officiates at a baptism, uh, is there a particular uh, exact utterance that you're supposed to say? Well, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then you go into the book of Acts, and I think it mentions two or three different variations. It says, baptize in the name of the Lord, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, baptize in the name of, I think it says, Jesus Christ. And so... The idea is that you're being baptized in the name of the God of the Bible. Um, you know, you and I do weddings occasionally, and we have the couple go over their vows, and sometimes they'll want a more formal uh, vow, and they'll say, you know, do you, Elizabeth, uh, Jane, so-and-so the third, Mary, Robert, William, Randolph, Hearst, <laughs> whatever <laughs> it is. And, and uh, sometimes you'll say, do you, Bill, take Mary? And you know, technically, they're both legal. As long as the people involved in a covenant and the witnesses realize that the parties understand who the commitment is being made to, that's what makes a covenant legal. So I know some churches put a lot of credence on the exact wording. In our church, we say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Sp Spirit. Sometimes I'll say in the name of the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's the idea. Okay, very good. We have another question. We'll look at that now. It says, how old should one be to be qualified for baptism? I heard a pastor one time that uh, he was on his way during a camp meeting. He was taking some children to the river that were going to be baptized. And their parents, of course, were present. And somebody said to brother, aren't those children too young to be baptized? And he said, are they old enough to be lost? I said, well, yeah. He said, well, then they're old enough to be saved. Mm -hmm. So when a person gets to the age of accountability where they understand the claims of the gospel, and that varies, you know, the, the closest thing we can come to any kind of a, an age in the Bible is the Jewish tradition that a boy reached manhood at 12. I think today, a bar mitzvah is usually at 13. That changed somewhere over the centuries. I don't know when. 
but uh, and for a girl it's a bas mitzvah. But they figured they're entering adulthood. They're responsible more for their decisions then. Um, and you know, so, some kids they're old enough to make that decision. Eight, nine years old. Eight might be a little young, but I say when they're old enough to read and have their own personal devotional life, they understand what sin is, what it means to uh, repent of their sins. Then they're probably old enough to be baptized. Okay, very good. We have another question. It says, there is one sin that I'm struggling to surrender. Should I be baptized? Well, um, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with, um, can I, I'm having trouble. Sometimes I don't push away from the dinner table soon enough. <laughs> uh, that's a struggle that people have through their lives. You know, it, you, you do okay for a while and then you may backslide. Uh, but if you're addicted to some kind of substance, you know, and, and um, you're con controlled by some drug or you're addicted to pornography or if, uh, you know, you're struggling with drinking or smoking or one of these things, you don't want to be handcuffed to the devil. And the reason I say that is uh, you have to ask, wh what will this do to my witness? If a person gets baptized like me, well, you know, I get baptized and I'm drinking with my buddies. I'm in jail telling them, yep, got baptized today. So well, I find Christian, you are. What are you doing here? And um, so, you know, you get baptized and then you're in the bar and you're, you're nursing a beer and you're blowing smoke rings and, and you say, yeah, Jesus set me free. And you'll say, well, you don't look like you've been set free. So you want to have those kind of um, uh, sins that, uh, you know, monopolize. You don't want to be addicted to any kind of habitual sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you want to have those things behind you. It doesn't mean, you know, after I got baptized, I thought I had made a lot of progress because I quit smoking and drinking and cursing. And, and then I got baptized, and then God said, uh, Doug, you know, you're pretty selfish and proud. So there's still things you're going to learn even afterward. And don't wait until you feel like you're perfect. But mm -hmm. you want to be committed to Jesus, and don't be handcuffed to the devil. Okay. Well, we've got some questions that people have sent in. Uh, this is a question that's uh, coming from Canada. And the question is... Um, if there is going to be a seventh day in heaven, will it be kept like the Sabbath? Well, I think it's going to be uh, much more glorious than what happens here on earth. But it does say there in Isaiah, that uh, chapter 66, that from one new moon to another, and that means from month to month, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come and worship mm -hmm. before me. And I know somebody's going to ask the question, Pastor Doug, well, y'all wait until the question comes in about the new moon. <laughs> I'm not going to answer it preemptively. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it, it's going to be different because God himself will be there with us. And in the beginning, when God made man, he then made one more day. He made a seventh day to commune with man. Can you imagine a day to be in the very presence of God and just the glory and the joy and the bliss that we'll feel is, you know, incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So it'll be real. Um, it's going to obviously be infinitely enhanced from whatever happens here. Okay. All right, another question. It says, how do you know if you are saved? You know, Jesus tells us you'll know them by their fruits. Um, do you love the Lord? Uh, do you appreciate what Jesus did for you? Uh, do you long to communicate with him? Do you think about him uh, through the day? Um, if you're tempted to sin, does that grieve you? Um, and, you know, you just, you have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Do you now start loving people more? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are the fruits of the Spirit. You'll start seeing them. You might not see all of them. You may not have a bumper crop right away. But when you go, when you turn around you, on the road to life, you're going a new direction. So has the direction of your life changed? And that, I think, is a good criteria. It doesn't mean that you're not still struggling. But have you given your life to the Lord? Has your direction changed? Like someone said, I, I'm not what I should be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Mm. Right. There needs to be growth and progress. Yeah. Here's a great question. It says, uh, I was born into Catholicism and I just got reborn recently. How do I know what church does baptism properly? Well, you can quickly research probably even on the Internet churches that baptize by immersion. So that's not hard to find out. I'd ask you to keep tuning in two more nights and we're going to be talking a little more about how do you find a church with the kaleidoscope of different churches out there that call themselves Christians. And there's many good people in these different churches. Don't misunderstand. 
But there's also a lot of churches have got some teachings that are off center. Mm -hmm. And so how do you find a good church where you can grow and be spiritually healthy? We're going to talk about that Sunday okay. night. Okay. So make sure and keep tuning in. All right. This person is asking, when Jesus was baptized, did he start a new mission on earth? Well, Christ really didn't begin his earthly mission until his baptism. He was subject to his mother and father. Jesus was probably helping in the family carpentry shop. It appears when Christ began his ministry that Joseph had died at that point. Mm -hmm. And we don't know exactly what year, but he never appears after Jesus' 12th birthday. So somewhere between Jesus being 12 and baptized at 30, uh, he was probably working in the family business. The people in Nazareth said, is this not the carpenter's son? They all knew who he was. And, uh, but he didn't really start his public itinerant preaching, teaching, healing ministry till his baptism. It says he was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism, and that's when he began to live a life of total service to, to God as our Savior and our teacher. He did more in three and a half years. You know, one reason I believe the Bible's true, Christ made the most outrageous prophecy. He said to his disciples, my teachings are going to go into all the world. That's a pretty... That's a pretty arrogant thing to say unless you know you're the son of God. He's never passed any university, never went more than 100 miles from the place of his birth. He's got no degrees. He leads no army. He does not have any royal station. He says, my teachings are going to go into all the world. Well, today Christianity is the biggest religion in the world. So he, that prophecy came true. Absolutely. So uh, what was the question? I got hypnotized by my own voice. Well, that's you, a good question. Remember. I'm trying to think what was the question, Pastor. I think <laughs> he you got answered hypnotized it. too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next All one. All right, now. we got another one. It says, I'm 17 years old and I'm struggling to be a Christian 24 7. Can you give me some advice? Oh, yeah. You know, and I got a text from a friend. He's probably hopefully watching now. And just this week, he said, Pastor Doug, he's in college and he's struggling in his relationship with Jesus. And, you know, especially during that age, more young people leave the Lord during the college years, between high school and 25. Because there's so many distractions. You're transitioning from being a child under your parents' authority to having all these freedoms and all this liberation. And, and you've got all the surges and, and hormones of youth. And uh, it's real easy to start putting spiritual things on the back burner. You feel eternal because you have no aches and pains yet. And you don't realize you're going to get old and life is temporary. And so it's a difficult time. And I tell you, when you're going through those years, the river's going to smooth out. Just get through the rapids. Hang in there. Even if you don't feel like it, talk to Jesus. He will never leave you. If you make some big mistakes, don't get discouraged. Stay with him. He will not forsake you. If you give your heart to the Lord, he adopts you. Even if you're his child and you misbehave, he still loves you. He'll chasten you. But don't turn away from Jesus. Pray put aside regular time to read his word, gather together with other believers, even if sometimes you may not enjoy it or understand, it is helping you, I promise. Mm -hmm. so Make Christian friends. Yep. You'll, you'll be influenced by your friends. Okay, this person is asking, should the laying on of hands be done after baptism to receive the Holy Spirit? Uh, the person says, I have never had that done for me, even though I have been baptized. Good question. You know, that, that's something that is a Bible teaching that's often neglected. Uh, it does say that the apostles, they came up to Samaria so that people, when they uh, were baptized, they would lay their hands on them. When Karen and I were in Russia about 26 years ago, 27 years ago, I knew she'd correct me, I've, uh, 28 years ago, it's getting longer all the time. <laughs> when, well, it was right after <laughs> communism. Right after communism fell in 92, yeah. And uh, when we baptized the people, uh, everybody, I couldn't say, I you know, couldn't speak Russian, and so I didn't do the declaration, but they, I'd been preaching to them through a translator. They really wanted me to lay hands on them when they came out of the pool. We had a big Olympic pool. And I stood there by the pool exit, and everybody that came out, I laid my hands over them. I said a prayer with a translator beside me. India, same thing. They all wanted us to lay hands on them and pray. And that's really actually very biblical. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible talks about the teaching of the laying on of hands. Okay. Another good question. It says, uh, can a person be baptized by a relative or does it have to be a pastor? If your relative is a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it should be a person who, is, who has some 
spiritual authority invested in them. And uh, you can read in the Bible, those who did baptizing were either apostles or deacons. And that means, and they all had hands laid on them to invest them with some spiritual authority to evaluate if a person was prepared. If uh, anybody in the family starts baptizing people too soon without them being, remember, you have to be taught. So you need someone qualified to teach them and know, do they understand? And, uh, you know, they should uh, have that authority. And so I think it should be a pastor, an elder. In rare cases, it might be a deacon or somebody that, uh, you know, if there's, like with Philip and the Ethiopian, he was technically, I think, a deacon at that point. Mm -hmm. But he became the evangelist. Okay, we have another question. It says, are we supposed to feel clean or completely new after we are baptized? Uh, well, you may not feel anything. You know, when you're baptized, you're really being saved by faith. It's kind of like asking a couple, after the ceremony, do I feel more love? Um, well, you, you should know there's a difference there because you've made a covenant, you've made a promise, and now you believe that relationship has changed. You know, I always like the part, uh, and I suppose you do too, where you... Uh, after they've said the vows, after you've had the prayer, and after they've agreed, then you turn them towards the audience and you say, by the power invested me according to the word of God and the, this state, I now pronounce you man and wife. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. And you declare it now they are one flesh. It's, it's a new relationship. And I've often had couples say, wow, it struck me, I am now married. Mm -hmm. I am now a wife, a husband. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a, I think you'll feel something. Baptism, Jesus said, when you do this, I am promising to wash away your sins and I will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit as you pray. Mm -hmm. Believe it and then you will feel. If you know all your sins are washed away, you're going to feel better. So do you believe it? If you believe his promise, you'll probably feel different. Mm -hmm. But don't say, well, I'm not feeling anything. God made a promise whether you feel it or not. Sometimes we don't know the sun is shining up there because the clouds are in the way, but it's still shining. Right. Somebody else is asking, how do you know where God is leading you in your life? You know, I'd, I'll start this answer by offering something free because I won't have time to give you all 12 points. But there's a free book you can download at Amazing Facts called Determining the Will of God because we get this question a lot. We put the answers into a little book determining the will of God. You'll see a little book with a weather vane on it. First of all, what does the word of God say? The Bible tells us in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Look for providential openings that God is giving you. Uh, sometimes he gives you the desires of your heart. Has God put a special interest? If you're praying about a direction, he'll give you different gifts and guide you in a particular direction. So there's about 12 different points in that book of how do you know God's will. We have time for one more quick question, Pastor yes, Ross. Yes, uh, that's a good one. It says, are you forgiven of your sins? Oh, let me reread this. Are you forgiven of sins you can't remember? Oh, good. I'm glad they asked that. Um, you don't have to worry about confessing the sins you don't remember. I can't remember every sin that I've committed. Um, the, the thing to do is just get on your knees and say, use the Ten Commandments as an outline and say, Lord, I know I'm guilty of worshiping other things as God. I maybe made idols out of other things in my life. I've been disrespectful with your name. I've not given you your time, like the Sabbath, or respected holy time. And you can look at the Ten Commandments. The Bible says if you're thinking impure thoughts, it's adultery. If you're thinking angry thoughts, it can be spiritual murder. And what do you call it? Spiritual homicide. So you go through the Ten Commandments and just begin with those. And then if you can't think of anything, say, Lord, Pray that prayer of David. Search me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And say, Lord, if I've forgotten something or if you borrowed something from your neighbor and you haven't brought it back in three years, maybe the Holy Spirit will say, you know, uh, it stops being borrowing after a year. You need to take your neighbor's rake back. There might be some restitution that needs to happen as you're confessing your sins and you're going to find a great relief. I prayed like that once and I became very convicted years later. The Lord put something on my heart I totally forgot about mm. and I had to right that wrong and I found great peace. I, as long as I didn't know, I was okay. Right. So he'll reveal those things at the right time and you don't have to worry. God is not trying to do a gotcha 
on the judgment day say, aha, you forgot this one. He wants to save you, Lord, mm -hmm. and he'll help you to be saved. Absolutely. I'd like to remind our friends who are joining us, we do have a book talking about baptism. It's Baptism, Is It Really Necessary? Of course, this is our free gift to anyone. If you'd like to receive it, text the word baptized to the number 40544. You'll be able to get a digital copy of the book. If you're outside of North America and you can't text, then go to revelationnow.com and you'll be able to download the book and read it and you'll be able to share it with somebody else. Real inspiring book. So we want to encourage you to take advantage of that free offer. Now, as we've mentioned a little earlier, tomorrow we have a very special program. It's going to be at 11 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning and we have one at 7 p.m. in the evening as well. Right. Sort of a double hit of this uh, subject coming up. So be sure Bowing to tune to in. Bowing to the beast. Tell so your friends. Yeah. Yep. Look forward to seeing you.